All right, hello everyone. Welcome, Cole Watkins here, and thank you for joining our Zoom into Adventure series. Let's go ahead and dive on in. If you've ever dove or traveled to Belize, dove with any of the Belize aggressors, or snorkeled in Belize, you likely spent some time at the turn of Atoll. So 20 miles east off the coast of Belize lays this chain of Caribbean islands that was declared a national marine reserve in 2012. At 30 miles long and 10 miles wide, this is the largest true atoll in the Belize and Mesoamerican reef system. Uh, and today we have the great honor of speaking with the team that protects this extremely important area. Let me introduce you my, my guest today, the executive director of the Turnoff Atoll Sustainability Association, Mr. Valdemar Andre. How are you doing today? I am doing well, Cole, and thank you for having me on. Yeah, thanks for being on. And, uh, and how's the weather down in Belize today? Oh, it's nice and sunny today, Cole. I don't want to show you outside. The sun is bright, it's warm. <laughs> yeah, rub it in. <laughs> That's our winter here for Christmas. Yeah. Well, all right. Well, let's go ahead and let's start learning about TASA. Um, you know, we've heard a lot of great things here at Aggressor about it and all the things you guys are doing down there in Belize. And um, yeah, tell us a little bit about yourself and a little bit about TASA. Sure. Um, yeah. Uh, first, let me take the opportunity to, to thank the aggressor team. I mean, we have an excellent partnership with the fleet of aggressor here, especially with Jerome Williams um, and David Gag and, and mm -hmm. Wayne. I had the opportunity to, to meet uh, with Mr. Wayne Brown. It was, mm -hmm. a, it was a great meeting, and, and I think we have a lot of um, we have to, we have a lot lot of avenues to continue to work together. But with Jerome, we have been working on installing moorings um, in the in the turn of Atoll marine reserve so that people don't have to throw anchor great and, and that damage the reef or damage the corals you know or create any havoc in, in those areas so we've had a good working relationship with, with jerome as one of the captains for one of the one of the boats that, that are here um uh my as, as you said my name is valimar andrade um i have a, a background in environmental planning and policy um I, you know, I've been in the field for a number of decades now in terms of managing protected areas. Uh, and this is the first time I have the opportunity to manage one large protected area that has significance for Belize. It's one of the largest marine reserves in Belize. Um, it has a high value contribution um, to the economy and, and to the conservation um, community um, for, for the world and for Belize for that matter. Um, and, you know, you know, this is this for me. This is a part of my 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 life goals in terms of you know being able to do what I love, but also being able to contribute to what my my children will will inherit and what the Belizean children and the world children will, will inherit from us here in Belize. That's great to hear. That's awesome. All right. Um, so for us, uh, we are a stakeholder-driven organization, and so our board is made up of of the stakeholders of the of the uh, marine reserve. Uh, we have a, a co-management agreement with the government of Belize. In Belize, we have a co-management models where where NGOs can manage on the, on behalf of the government of Belize. And so we have a co-management agreement with the fisheries department. So they sit on our board as the vice chair. We also have an expert in natural resources management. We have representation from the tourism private sector, from the resorts that um, that have that do conduct business on Turnaf. The Belize Tourism Board, who is the government um, arm of the of the tourism side of things in Belize, um, the University of Belize, um, who um, who basically have a research station in at Kalabashki near to where we have our our um, our Rangers headquarters um, there in Kalabash. Um, we also have the two large fishing um, associations, which is the Belize Federation of Fishers and the Belize Fishing Cooperatives Association represented on our board. And so those stakeholders are actually who make the decision on how the marine reserves will be run, the marine reserve will be run, uh, where do we invest our the finances that we are able to raise um, and to be able to best have an impact on the stakeholders of the area and, and to be able to have it for people to enjoy as well when they visit Belize. I see. Okay, great. Right. So uh, you, um, I know you, you said you did have some, um, some uh, visuals to show. Do you want to first walk us through like the organizational structure and... and... Sure. Um, Sure. So just just to let you um, just to let you see a, a bit of um, exactly how how that works in in practicality, um, I'll share. 
So if, if you can, yeah, uh, one second. Yeah, so as, you, as I said, um, you know, we basically um, start from the policy direction and our policy direction we get from the fisheries department. And so we have an advisory committee and a managed access committee that basically advises um, how things happen on the ground, um, you know, and those are made up of stakeholders of the area, just like the board. And so we continuously inform the stakeholders to be able to make decisions, whether it's on scientific um, um, aspects with respect to the managed access committee. We have a program called a managed access program with the fisheries department in which we have nine fishing areas and fishers are licensed to access two fishing areas at a time. And mm. so most of the time we are area six, Turnip is known as area six. And so most of our fishers are licensed for area six and seven, seven being the blue hole of, of okay. uh, you know. And so though that committee basically advises on who are permitted to access area six. And you know the fishers, uh, we also from our database, we are able to tell whether they have infractions. And so if we have, they have infractions, we would flag that to the fishers department and basically say, you know, we don't want to allow this fisher in. Uh, we don't want to give him a license because he has had a bad track record and he has been to court so many times and been charged, you know. And then in terms also, in terms of policy decision, they, as I said, those stakeholders that I spoke to you about uh, make up the board of directors. And so they decide um, the budget, they decide, uh, you know, which direction we go in terms of our management plan, because we also have a management plan that guides um, whether it's the um, enforcement activities, whether it's the science activities, whether it's the climate change activities or the education activities and, and how we do business. And then we have operational management uh, where I'm the executive director and then I oversee uh, uh, I'm basically a finance and HR group and an operations group that really does the work on the ground. And so the finance group basically helps to raise the funds and manage the funds in, uh, in relation to whatever agreements we have with donors and how those are gonna be audited and how Oh, because we, we also are a non-profit and we are also a non-government organization. So we are registered under two, under two different legislation. And so under both of those, we have to be able to file our audits and all our records and, and be able to obtain a certificate of good standing. And we have been able to do that from year to year. Our operations team basically is made up of an education team and an and a enforcement and science team that work on the ground. That is that is comprised of about 16 field staff who rotate um, 14 days in and seven days out to be able to manage um, that area. And they basically operate from three bases. And I'll just quickly show you. So Turnip is 325,000 acres big, you know, so it's 30 miles wide um, and, and 10 miles wide and 30 miles in, in length. And so, um, you know, we have to be able to take care of this. We have bases in the north, as you can see, the Monger Key Conservation Post. Then we have uh, in the central. So the, that northern post basically patrols from from where you see my cursor to the to the central. Okay. Right? And then and then the central post at Kalabash Key um, patrols from the center to the south, and then. The, the key bokel conservation post which is one that we recently established about a year and a half ago because this whole area is a spawning irrigation site that's very active it's multi-species um, fish uh, fin fish spawning irrigation site and we have hmm. lots of pressures from illegal fishing illegal and unregulated fishing and so we had to establish a farther base here so okay. we have a, a, a small base in, in that area and that they have that area to patrol. And so we have had a concerted effort to control that those pressures. And we have been able to do it generally. We have about, I would say we have about uh, 35 or so um, cases that, that we take up per year, but that can mean uh, multiple infractions. One case can have up to five or six infractions, depending on, it can be um, licensing without, operating without a valid fishing license it can be fishing out of season it can be um, taking taking species um, you know below size limits 
or above size limits because some of them like um, like the Nassar grouper you cannot take over a certain size because that's when they're sexually mature and they and that's their reproductive life life part of their the stage part of their life that they reproduce yeah. um, and so we have to manage all of these activities and then there are seasons for conch lobster and finfish that, that that we also have to manage and so that comes down to um you know how do we how do we patrol and, and basically if you can see these figures here um if you notice we have a good patrol record where we are averaging you know around in 2019 we we're averaging around 28 patrol days for the month so that's almost a complete month of patrols well yeah uh, and then we log how many fishing vessels we are seeing for the day how many um, tourism vessels we're seeing for the day. We do also, there are some semi-resident camps that fish lobster. And so we also do camp checks. So we're able to check their freezers, um, check their product, um, hmm. ensuring that they're also abiding by, by those. And then we have the tourism sites that we also check and we check that they also are abiding by, by, by those. And so, um, you know, that's, that's an important part of what we do. Um, we use several systems, and this, what you see on the screen here is from our um, spatial monitoring and reporting tool. So we are able, these dots that you see here for Calabash, Kibokel, and Maraki are where we are encountering the fishers. So each dot represents where we encounter the fishers. And so, and then on the bottom, you can see the tracks for patrols. And so we are able to tell with some level of certainty if the, the patrol regime is robust enough. So we have a measure, we have also a heat map that we run that tells us whether that area has been patrolled two or more times for the month, five or more times for the month, 10 or more times for the month, you know, so that we are able to also ensure that from our side, our guys are also being forthright and keeping within um, our activities. Right? Um, and then in terms of, in. Uh, enforcement summaries you can see here as I told you we have about 35 charges for the year this is about our average and then the number of convictions for 2019 was 11 because it doesn't mean that every every case that we take to court will turn into a conviction or it doesn't mean that we take every case to court as well right yeah but so these convictions can be uh, for multiple for multiple infractions as well you know? so each conviction may add up to to uh, multiple infractions. And now we're getting a better system because we, in the past we weren't tracking the verbal, because we are, um, I forgot to mention that under our system, um, we are able, under our system, we are able to, um, you know, we are, we have the de de delegated powers from the minister and the government that we're able to uh, verbally warn, we can give a written warning, we can summons to court or we can take them to court. So once we find an, uh, an, an issue, we prepare a case file. We have been trained by the prosecutor at the Fisheries Department to prepare a case file. We also have so, a staff that has been trained by the US, uh, by the US um, Embassy on how to do prosecution as well. And then we prepare that case file, turn it over to the fisheries department prosecutor, and then we take them to court. And then we we appear as we, we appear as a as a part of that court action to give evidence and to provide the corroboration of what we found, how we found it. And it has to be detailed because you know, if there's one little mistake, like in the past, we have had, you know, a simple thing, like instead of saying so much pounds or you know, there was a mistake in the in the unit. And that has uh, that has allowed us to lose a case. Oh wow! You know? you know, so the guys have learned and have come from strength to strength. We have a whole system of checking the case files as best as possible, um, and, and I think we have gotten better at that. And so we are able to we are able to uh, to be able to do this. One of the interesting things about about um, about Turner. One of the interesting things about Turnip is is we, we are able to estimate um, what is the benefit um, and what are the costs. Um, so in terms of a, in terms of a cost, we are talking about an annual cost of about six hundred and fifty thousand US budget to be able to do the work that we do. But the benefit is around two hundred and twenty five million dollars per annum. Wow. And that 
and that comes from about mm -hmm. 60 million in tourism, about uh, maybe five or so million, maybe two and a half million in fisheries, and the bulk of it, 191 million US dollars in, in storm protection value from the coral reefs, mangroves, and seagrass from Turnet, because it's just um, outside of, of Belize City. If you remember, if you remember that slide that I showed you earlier, um, you know, here, this is Turnip, and this is the most populated center for the country of Belize. And so right. Turnip acts as a barrier, and if you can see all of that, all of that area is mangrove, right? And all on the coral fringes, because remember an atoll is formed from a volcanic event that took place in the past, and then the, uh, you know, the edges of that volcano rise above the sea level and then it starts growing a cor coralline formation and then eventually it forms into land which then takes on mangroves and then eventually you have this whole key structure that is formed right yeah and so that serves as like a barricade to storms coming in for blee yeah. cities right yeah so wow. it, dissip it dissipates the wave action it dissipates the wind action and so it provides that protection and insurance so it's a natural protection and insurance for for for, for that area Wow, perfectly placed, huh? Um, <laughs> yes, and so, yes, no, no, it's, you know, it's like, it's like the, you know, it's, it's a, it's a critical component of, 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 of what, what we do there. Um, I also wanted to just share with you, um, you know, you know, in terms, because you had asked, you had asked about the mangroves per turn up. Right? Yeah. Um, and so, you know, as I said before, you know, it lies right, right in front of, of the Lee City, the Turnipatal Marine Reserve, and basically, the in past in past uh, in past estimates that has had been done by uh, by Natural Capital, it the estimation of the of the storm protection value of these formations is about one point seven five billion dollars or three point five billion Belize dollars um, mm -hmm. per annum. For turnip alone, the coral reefs, mangroves, and seagrass provide about 191 million US dollars or 282 Belize dollars, because it's a two to one conversion, um, you know, in terms of um, storm protection value for, for turnip. And these are things that, you know, we have 11,000 hectares of mangroves in turnip. And these are things that I think many times as, as humans, we, 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 we take for granted, you know, but you know, this is how the mangroves on Turnip look, right? And we are working on this program basically to convert this uh, to a blue carbon resilience program on the voluntary carbon market. We are trying to do a pilot along with the Nature Conservancy um, to be able to show that you know this has beyond storm protection value, it also has a blue carbon value where it is sequestering the carbon that we breathe out every day or that, that we put out um, from different processes into, into the environment. And so, um, you know, so I think that is, uh, is, is an important part of, of what we do. And so, um, you, know, you, know, you know, many times I don't think people realize that to run one of these marine reserves, you're, you're looking at, you know, you're, 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 we are seen as conservationists, but in fact, we are really investors. And so we are investing in safeguarding the products, for example, that the aggressor comes to see. Right. And, and, and so it's a business relationship, right? We are, helping, we are helping you protect your product and you help us protect our product as well by paying the fees, by helping mm -hmm. us with contribution, by doing what you do right now, educating people about what we do. Because many times people are not fully aware of all the the benefits or all that it takes to do this and so that's why we're grateful to be able to, uh, to take this approach with, with, with you here today yeah yeah it's great and, and um and we're definitely helping each other that's definitely uh that's definitely um easy to see there uh, i wanted to talk about uh the su surveillance smart and also the uh the drone prototype that we talked about on our preliminary call okay sure yeah, so basically, as I said before to you, you know, um, the smart system, you know, is basically, uh, you know, we're using a phone and we're, we're it's a satellite based system um, that basically 
from the phone it has a gps location but it has an inbuilt platform that makes it possible to collect store communicate and analyze ranger collected data on illegal fishing wildlife patrol routes uh, management actions that we take and so we are you know this is basically to be able to demonstrate to um to companies like yourself, um, to visitors, uh, the, the value of, and, and, and our performance in terms of conservation action and our conservation out, outputs that we, what we purport to say that we are, what we are doing, right? This system has been implemented worldwide. Uh, we are working with the Wildlife Conservation Society on, on this. Um, and so, we are able to see a platform like this uh, in terms of our enforcement patrol. So we're able to, to break it down to look at, okay, our patrols by mandate. So we're able to see how much time, how much patrol time is spent on logistics, how much patrol time is spent on joint patrols with the Coast Guard, because we mm -hmm. have them on about 75% of our patrols. We are able to see how much of that is night patrols. We are able to see how much of that is support patrols, uh, you know, and so uh, we are also able to tell by base um, how many infractions and where those infractions have been. Um, we are also able to tell how many vessel checks, uh, you know, whether it's a it's a canoe, whether it's a mother ship, whether it's a skiff, uh, whether it's a tourism vessel, uh, you know, exactly what has what has been checked. And then we also able to tell how many pounds of fish were sampled because we have to have a, a, a valuable and important sample size um, to be able to ascertain for sure that uh, our our population of conch lobster or fish are in are in are in good health that the population is good. Also, the 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 the, the population uh, the total. Uh, the total look at of the population are we are, are we having too many juveniles or are we having too many adults you know many of the times if, if your the fishing pressure is high you will note that it is skewed towards a lot of juveniles because you're, hmm. you're taking the bigger ones right right and so that that is a concern because there has to be a balance and then we also look at how the population uh how the population inside the conservation areas look as opposed to outside the, the conservation areas where they're able to harvest them. And so for now, we have some indication that there is a balance. And generally, you want to see better sizes, better size class within the conservation zone. But a balance is good because it means that you're, you're being effective, but you still need to push to get it to the other side of, of that spectrum. Um, the challenges we have had with this, um, as, as you guys know, running boats out there, we have high staff turnover because, you know, you know, having to be at sea and right now because of COVID and, and, and the downfall of the tourism industry where we get a lot of revenues to support our management, we have had to go to a, a one month deployment to diminish costs. The guys are also only being they're they're being paid 100 percent when they're in the field and 50 percent when they're at home, uh, because that's what they that's what the funds um, can do right now. And so that, that can create turnover issues. Um, also damage of equipment. Um, you're at sea with salt and a lot of sun, sand. Mm -hmm. And so it affects um, your computers. It affects your smartphones. It affects your engines because the engines are, if you're doing 28 patrol days for the, for the month, you know how many hours you're putting on those engines, right? And, right. and, and by policy, we are only using um, four stroke engines, which are more efficient and done don't dump oil into into the sea okay you know but uh you know it's still a lot of pressure on on, on anyone uh, on anyone equipment um we have had to learn it skills uh, i'm sure just like you um, now everything is online now everything is computerized even our 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 engines you know you have to hook up a computer to figure out what uh, what has been doing, um, you know, whether people were, were, were overpowering it under, you know, whether or they haven't maintained it to time, you know, because we have to change the oil every, every uh, 100 hours, mm -hmm. um, you know, and it's the same for other pieces of equipment. So we've learned, we have actually sent um, staff members to get trained in auto mechanic and outboard engine maintenance. And so mm -hmm. we have two staff members that are fully certified by Yamaha. To be, okay. able to, to be able to do this um, 
staff supervision and feedback because again there are user errors that we have to keep correcting you know people simple things like people putting in the wrong information in the wrong field and so when you pull up the report you can see that there are discrepancies um, uh, reduced funding of patrols during covid um, our biggest cost is fuel and and, and salaries and so you know uh, in, in a time of COVID, we had to cut patrols to, to just remain effective and efficient, right? Um, and also looking at, for the future, predictable sources of financing. How do we maintain this over time? Because if you have the ebbs and flows, then you allow people to come in and do illegal activities. Um, the successes, though, have been improved ranger um, strategic enforcement planning, and, you know, and also we are able to do reports to the donors and show I mean, when you can, when I can show you that we have actually been patrolling because we can see the routes, you know, it, it makes a difference for a donor. It makes a difference uh, for people like your, for people like yourself to understand the level of investment and the level of enforcement that we have on the ground. Mm -hmm. So it's, it leads to improved protection of the marine protecting area. We have better knowledge of the users and what they're doing, um, whether it's good or bad, right? Okay. And so in in so in many cases. Um, we have also uh, we are also in a process where the fishers are voluntarily using this system as well and so we are able now to see where the fleet is and have a more direct patrol and strategic patrol um, schedules to be able to address them but also for fishers that refuse to put the the, uh, the voluntary system on then we know that those are fishers that not necessarily will do things in the right way uh, we have a better interaction with our fishing community because this mechanism, this um, this equipment has an SOS button, and I'll talk a little bit more about about that. Um, we also have a smart virtual classroom. As I said, everything is gone virtual, and so we're able to 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 be able to train the guys and continuously answer questions on uh, on what they're doing, uh, what the team is doing on the ground. Mm -hmm. and um, remote su support and men mentorship by the people who know how to do this. As I said before, uh, we have for this, we have formed a committee with the Port Authority, and they're the ones who monitor um, any uh, SOS calls or any infractions, because this system is also able to, we, we, we can geofence. And so if a vessel crosses into a conservation zone, we are, it, it alerts us. Right? It's the same way we have geofencing, and if our patrol boats come out of a certain range, it alerts us to say, okay, they are not on, on regular patrol. And so we have to know why. And so we also have the National Coast Guard, the Fisheries Department, the Bees Audubon Society, ourselves, and Wildlife Conservation Society working as a team. Um, and if you see the, um, if you see this, this equipment here, this little red toggle here is the SOS. So if, if, uh, uh, a patrol boat or a fisher runs into trouble at sea with their engine or some damage or something, they can depress this for 10 seconds and we, we get an alert that says this is an SOS alert, something is wrong, we are able to tell where they are and we generally can get to them within an, an hour or two wow. um, and we know with, with precise detail where they are. In the past, we would have to be hunting all over the place for them. Right. And you which know, spent, which waste fuel, right? Wastes a lot of fuel. It wastes a lot of manpower, and you know, and and, and it takes away from from patrol time as well. And so, mm -hmm. we have, you know, so the solution has been a system that is real time. The equipment must be rugged. We tested phones and different equipment in the past, but they, as you as you see here, some models that we tested, but they didn't hold up. Um, it has to provide a quid pro quo to the to the stakeholder um, in terms of uh, alert trigger. Okay. Uh, uh, SOS, you know, it has to be cost effective and it has to be self powered because we also, um, this one is solar powered. Right? Oh, great. And it, and it also has a tamper system at the end of the day. Um, and so this is the system that we identified and you can see the, the platform here. And so when you see these little sailboats, this is, this is actually where the vessels were on internet for that day. And so we are, up, we are able to tell with preciseness where those boats are. And it's, if it's a skip, it will show a different a module out, out, out here. Huh. Um, and, then, and then for our patrols, we are able to, and for the fishing vessels, we can, we can log that we can look at the tracks and see exactly where they went. Okay. Right? So if you notice on that side, and again, the SOS trigger and the Tampa, Tampa alerts that the, 
that we that we spoke about. Um, it provides a position every 15 minutes because the more, like let's say if we wanted every five minutes, it is more expensive to get that data. Okay. And also we would have to have greater storage to store that data. Um, it provides geofencing, so we are able to to geofence and no-take zones, MPA boundaries, and also for us, we 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 geofence where our guys can can go and not go um, in terms of the patrol vessels. Um, and it is web-based. It is on. It, it's a Google platform. No? Um, and so, so we plan to we plan to continue using this. And it, this is just a look at, at the type of fishing fishing vessels that we have in these. Generally, a skiff or a sailboat here. These sailboats can take up to like 10 or 12 fishers um, pool. Wow. Right? And they go out for anywhere from five to eight days. Right? Yeah. At the, at wow. The and they're all, wow. <laughs> and so, and so say you pull up on a boat that's got 10 guys in it fishing and they're all registered like they're supposed to, but maybe one is not. So how does, how would that, how would that go? Is everybody okay, sure. in trouble <laughs> or is, is that guy yeah. by himself? So, um, the, the protocol for, for enforcement um, is basically when you pull up, um, first of all, the guys have to do a U-turn because they have to inspect around the boat. Because many times we have found that they will not keep the illegal product on the boat. They will hang it off the side or put it off in a canoe. And so we have to get a good view of what is happening there. Then okay. we, uh, we, re we request boarding. Uh, there's an official request for boarding of a vessel. Uh, this is... This is um, this is so less protocols that we have to follow and then once they give permission to board then we board we request all the fishing licenses um, and there are a couple of things that can happen here so if one person doesn't have a fishing license so normally you have uh, let's say six or eight of them that are fishers and a cook and the cook has a special license so the cook can have a cooking they are able to be on there as a cook but they cannot fish okay right and the um, the rest of the crew can fish um, uh, but if there's one person on there without a fishing license then um, there are two options you know that person we have to take that person off and get them to belize city um, or the entire crew is turned back um, with that vessel to belize city uh, because it is the responsibility of the captain to ensure that every fisher he takes out has a valid fishing license for area six. Okay. So, you know, and, 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 and both that person and the captain can possibly be charged depending on, on, the, on the situation, but definitely the person without a fishing license. No, there are times when, for example, during registration that they may have a receipt that says that they have already uh, went in and did the licensing procedure, but hasn't, haven't actually received their license and so, they have a time period with which they can operate with that receipt. But if we find them on another, on another, um, on another fishing um, mission, um, with that receipt again, then then they, they become in trouble, right? Because that just means that they don't they, they don't intend to pick up their license. Yeah, they're not listening. What they're kind of gel time? What kind of gel time are these guys getting for something like that? Um, many times it is a it is a charge, and so um, in terms of the product, there is a there is a certain um, there is a certain charge per per tail. For example, if it's if it's conk or per or per or per pong, if it's if it's um, if it's conks. Um, um, but if the if these in many cases, if these guys, if it's a severe infraction and they have done it before, then yes, you are talking. You know, it can be from six months up jail time that, that they will have to serve wow. you know and and we have had we have had some of those you know and so uh you know you know this is to show that you know you always have uh, a few people who will try to um engage in illegal uh, activities um you know within 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 these reserves um and so uh you know once you know once these once the the case is completed we also have to do uh, logging and reporting of it and ensure that uh, you know we are able to uh, to to show and demonstrate uh, what happened let's say if it was thrown out of court we also look at the lessons learned here why why was it thrown out of court you know what is the issue what do we have to do better next time uh, and i know in the in the five years that i've been at tasa uh, we have learned a lot because many times the devil is in the detail in terms of the actual uh, the actual regulation and the actual infraction and how it takes place 
Um, we, we also many times will charge everybody on the vessel, right? If there is an infraction, because wow. while they, ha they have a system uh, to identify their fish product, for example, they would take the label of the sausage cans and pair it. And so that one belongs to coal. And the one with the the one with the uh, with the uh, cigarette wrapper belongs to Baltimore, and and they may not own up to it, and so we end up charging all five or eight or ten people and taking everybody to court. Wow! And then their you friends know. are really mad at them, right? Then yeah, then yes, then it's <laughs> they not lose such their a, their fishing buddies. <laughs> it's not such a happy situation, right? Uh, sure. At the end of the day, right. And, well, and go ahead. No, you go ahead. I'll, I'll, I'll let you finish up before we switch. No, and topics. I can say, no, no, you know, there, you know, it sometimes it can get severe. Uh, like we, we recently, in the last couple of months, we had an, a case of uh, 475 um, pieces of conks that were illeg illegally harvested. They were undersized, you know. Right. The, the problem with that is by the time we get the conk, um, you know, uh, it's it's dead. We can't put it back, right? Dang. Unless unless we find it in shell, then we then we we evidence it and, and then we put it back. But other than that, and then what happens? So that that evidence is also turned over to the fisheries department. Once the court case is done, and the product is still good, then the fisheries department normally donates it to a feeding program for the schools or the elderly or or, or, or the children's home. You know, okay. and, and, and so that is how the, the, the product is. Um, or we can request it to go to a particular school that we work with. Okay. You know, or a particular um, group that we work with, you know, and, but it has a chain of custody that, 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 that happens. Okay. Well, uh, we didn't get to see any images on your slides there of the drone, which was really interesting. Can you pull yes. that up? You said, do you yes. have slides on that? Yes. Yeah. Um, so, so this is a this is a holistic view of the um, of the smart and how we pick up you know this is all the patrols for for one year right and so you're able to see that in one slide um, do you have yes your, we're not seeing your screen right now okay sure let me sorry about that it's okay Learn, learning here <laughs> <laughs> yeah so I was saying that this is a holistic view of of you know one year of patrols on on one on, at one snapshot, so you're able to see this, you know, how much patrol is there. Um, these are the guys that that passed the Yamaha training. Um, okay. From, from our team, you know, and it was, it was, I think they attended training for one year and they had to give up um, their every Saturday for a year to be able to be able to, to get this done. And our drone, as you said, um, you know, you know, because one of our highest costs and uh, and we're also looking at efficiencies, we're looking at ways to cut, um, how do we create those efficiencies with, because fuel is expensive. So we have been looking at drones and this is, a, this is one drone that we have tested with the Zoological Society of London. Um, I actually met them at a science conference in London in 2018 and we, we, we quickly formed a relationship because this drone basically has a number of things that we are able that we are able to uh, that we are able to do um, with it. Um, one, it's it's able to fly the entire atoll, um, you know, under 19 knots of under 19 knots of um, of wind. Wow. Um, if it's made of styrofoam, so if it crashes, we can duct tape it and get it back up in the air. You know, <laughs> and, it, so, and it'll float. It'll You're... float, so it can land in the water. Um, you know, so it makes it it it, it, it makes it um, up for our situation at sea. Um, mm -hmm. It has a high resolution camera, so uh, we were able to see boats. We were able to see um, lobster traps you know, that are in fair in, in in shallower water. And so we're able wow. to see quite a bit from there. So, um, you know, it, you know. This this one costs about twenty or twenty five thousand U S dollars, and we are still raising the funds to, to try to get one uh, after our feasibility. But we run a feasibility for nineteen days, and we not only look at enforcement, but we also look at monitoring because another cost is monitoring. So we are able to monitor megafauna like sharks, rays, manatees with this as well. You know, okay. so we, we we can do counts for this, and so. 
Um, this is our base here on Kalavashki, and this is the Coast Guard base, just to give you an orientation. And all of these, are, this is all mangrove land in the area. But this Great. is from this is a shot from that drone. Okay, very cool. Right, right from from from, from high up. Um, we also work with um, with stakeholders because to relieve the pressure of um, fishing, we have to look at complementary or alternative livelihoods. Um, and so one of them that we're looking at is seaweed farming. And so we, again, we have partnered with PNC, um, the fisheries department, Bell, Bell Trade, who is looking at the business side and the, and the marketing side. We are also partnering with the cooperatives department to farm these um, fishers into groups. And we have an official training program um, here. Here on the bottom, you see two of our guys that were trained to level one trainers so that they can continue training fishers in how to in how to do mariculture and um, so we are hoping that this can be an infill for revenue and we already have taken one farm to production and so we are going to see how that works um, as, as we move into the future um, this is our continuous fishes regulation training that we do uh, year to year and so the, uh, here you can see our our fishers prosecutor training our guys and they're also able to show them how to how to prepare the evidence, how to fill out the evidence label properly. They're able to ask them in the questions uh, of concerns that they have had with different cases. And so we do these trainings about twice a year. Um, this is our this is our team being uh, our team member who was trained in in uh, in prosecution. Um, you know, and so uh, you know we take this this work very seriously. Uh, also, our sessions with, uh, with with WCS, uh, with Coast Guard, and uh, our donors to be able, to be able to inform them, and the media to be able to inform them about the work that we are doing, because it's an education program for everybody. At at, at the end of the day, um, in terms of our science work, as I said, uh, we we gather um, scientific data, uh, even measuring the traps, the type of traps that are being used, and we have been able to do a lobster fishing inventory for the entire. So all of these areas that you see here are where lobster is being fished right right and then this is a profile of the of the fin fish of um of turnip and you can see that the majority of them are snappers mm -hmm. and, and hogfish a high percentage of 61 percent snappers um, 10 percent hogfish and then you can see grunts jacks triggers angels mackerels yeah right? So just to give you a quick profile, this is a little bit more work in, in, uh, in terms of our catch and uh, catch data. Um, we work closely with our with our fishers, and you know we we keep formulating programs. So this is a this is a this is a program that we are looking at you now tagging the the traps, and so you see the guys tagging the traps here. Hmm. So we're able to tell. Um, we're able to tell, you know, how many traps the fisher put in the water for that year and how many they took back out. And in, in the event that there is a hurricane um, or any natural event that would wash away and these traps become ghost traps, then we are able to know exactly how many of them were retrieved and how many of them are lost at sea. Because remember, once they are lost at sea, they don't stop fishing. These, these are still continuously fishing. And so it mm. can potentially affect the, the production of the area. Right. Um, and then to our education program, uh, yeah. we do we do education with our communities and uh, you know in Copper Bank and Chunush especially. Um, and you can see our team basically uh, you know has been at schools um, in the districts at schools in the, in our fishing community, talking about the about the work that that we do. Um, for this year, we did um, tr some three hundred. We work with 300 students, um, 24 teachers. Um, you know, because these are these are small communities and, and they're mm -hmm. far away from from where we are at. We also do educational booths at special events. Um, so the schools would invite us, or we, or, 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 or different entities would invite us. And so here you see we covered 950 students. Um, 25 teachers and 95 adults so we take a matrix and you know and we do it through games we do it you know so it's 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 they're learning but they're 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 learning while having fun right great yeah one of one of our greatest activities is actually boat to boat 
education with the fisheries. And so we are, you know, we plan these pre-season and post-season for conch lobster and fin fish. And so we go out there with a, with a bag of chips or a johnny cake. A johnny cake for us is, is like a little bread with cheese or ham and a mm -hmm. coke. A coke mm -hmm. is a commodity in, in, you know, when you're out at Turner, you know, yeah. no shop, there are no shops out there. And so <laughs> we, we hang out with them for a while, try to understand how the catch is going, what they think the issues are, you know, what issues do they do they see from us? And so on these trips, we normally don't do enforcement unless it's a blatant issue. Okay. Right. So we're there to better understand. And so we do this with the, um, with the on the vessels, but we also go to the camps and meet and meet on, on these. So for for this year, we're able to visit six fishing camps, twelve vessels, um, and and three miners um, and eight and one fishers. So during the summer, um, miners are able to go to sea. But otherwise, if there's a miner on board, then we also take them off, mm. and, and and one of the adults has to go along with them. We also do stakeholder engagement in the communities. And you can see here the fishers. Basically, we are we are reporting to them, and we are also discussing with them. We normally do this at their AGMs. We have also brought them to our in, in this in this image. You are seeing them visiting our base at Calabash, so that they can see how this works and and, and how we do business. Um, this is a bus stop that we built for the fishers because they get up at four in the morning to catch a bus to come to Belize to, to get their sailboat to go over to Turner. Oh. And um, they didn't have a bus stop, and many times in the rain they would get wet before they on the on the get on the bus. Mm. And so through through one of our donors, we were able to find the resources, and the fishers put in the labor, and we built a bus stop. And so, but those things might look like why are you building a bus stop, right? But it <laughs> is how we engage and how we connect. Sure. With our with our stakeholders, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's simple things like that. Um, for example, we, we also fundraise to donate a, a, a projector, a, a, a projector for our um, for our school in, in Copper Bank. Great. You know, and you know, and it was I walked into a I walked into a meeting. Uh, one of the agencies were complaining about a new projector that they had, and I said, you know, if you if you want to get a better one, you can donate this one to Copper Bank. And they said, okay, no problem. Just write me a letter. We wrote them a letter and they donated it. <laughs> you <know>? Great. <laughs> and so, you know, that's that's the kind of thing that we do on behalf. Um, and as I said, with beyond seaweed, we have also trained um, our fishers in tour guiding. Mm -hmm. And we have done this along with the Tour Belize Tourism Board. And so they are officially certified to tour guide. And many of them have, have dual roles now so some when there is high season for tourism they may be guiding and then when there is low season for tourism then they go to fishing and so again it takes the pressure off um, and so we have gotten them through a regular tour, tour guide license and now we have gotten getting them the, we have also gotten them professional tour guide license there are different levels that they can uh, achieve and these fishers know the marine environment like the back of their hand and so uh, you know no better person to tell you a story, right? Of mm -hmm. course, you know, no, no fisherman will tell you their fish was small, right? I'm sure, right. <laughs> I'm sure they have some incredible stories, right? But, you know, just training them on how to present, how to engage with visitors, mm -hmm. what are the do's and don'ts, you know, they keep smiling, um, understanding our branding and that kind of stuff um, helps, helps us work along with them. Yeah. And, you know, one of our biggest achievements is being able to have a network. Um, you know, at the end of the day, we there's no way for just like we're doing here with Aggressor. We can't do this alone. Uh, you know, this is something that we do with partnership, with understanding. And so we have had many donors like the Bertorelli Foundation, Project Heroes Conservation Trust, Belize Fisheries Department, Belize National Coast Guard, Belize Port Authority, Coastal Zone. You know, we work with our with you know environmental defense fund uh, find catch uh, with individuals like mr leslie who we have uh, you know we have three models of, 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 of ownership for our conservation post we have a mou with the port authority for the one in the north at Margaret key the central one we have actually land documents for those we own that um, that was donated to us by the government and then we have uh, a, a, a 
private agreement with Mr. Leslie for the southern one at Ibokel at that era in which he allowed us to use the island and the facility that was there and we just we just fixed it up um, and so we so this is something um, as I said you know that, that 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 we cannot do alone right. you know and, and are grateful for for like this type of partnership that we're having here to be able to share with you what we do from time to time well to, <clears throat> tell me if, if someone's watching this today and wants to make a donation what's the best way that they can do that Sure. Um, uh, as I um, as I told before, I I have sent you some information on the link. I'm also um, you know so they can contact us. Okay. Um, in the future, in the future, we uh, we are we are a couple of weeks away from having a platform where they can go directly to the platform and Great. donate through the platform. But we will be we will, in the meantime we'll give you a link. We'll give you my contact information and, and you know. Beyond the donation, we also always are want to form a relationship with, with anybody that gives and understanding why they are giving, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and be able to, 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 to make that connection so that they can see that, you know, the money that they put in or the resources, because, you know, it's not only about money as well. If, if they have, I, I know they have a lot of fishers or boat users mm -hmm. that get rid of their engines after so many hours, but it's still, for us, it's still useful. And so okay. we would be more than happy to find a way to get those ships to Belize for us to be able to use for our patrol vessels or equipment like computers and others, if you want to donate that, because you may have a business and are able to do it that way, if that is more effective for you. Um, you know, again, it's about building a relationship. It's about understanding what you're contributing to, because, uh, you know, like yourself in the aggressor, mm -hmm. you know, we, you are, you are now official members of, of Turner Fatal Marine Reserve, you, you you basically are contributing to what we do, how we do it. Uh, we are able to understand from your diving community. Um, you know, in the future, we want to see what we want to get a log of what they're seeing. Are they seeing better, more? They should be seeing better, bigger, more improved profiles of, of the fish that, that they come to see and also of the corals formation over time, right? And so we use you to also track that. And so you can donate. You can donate your your knowledge. It doesn't have to be money. You know, you can give us back data on exactly what it is, so we can engage on on that aspect as well. Very cool. Well, I think this has been a great call, and I uh, again we we appreciate everything you guys are doing down there in Belize with Tassa, and uh, and we'll be sure to uh, once be sure to let me know when that website is up where they can make di direct deposits or donations. And we'll get a post out on our on our end. Try to get okay, you guys. Sure. Yeah. And you're invited, Cole. You're invited to come to, to Belize. You don't have any need to be in the winter there. Yeah, that's right. I know. I want to get back to Belize. I got to dive there last year. It was amazing. We saw spotted eagle rays and sharks, and I had a great time on the Belize Aggressor 4. But I would love to come down there and spend a day with you guys patrolling a little great. bit. Finding some yeah. finding some bad guys, <laughs> as my <laughs> as my son would say. <laughs> All right, Valdemar, it's right. been great. It's been an honor having you on. And we, uh, we appreciate you uh, taking time to speak with us today. All right. Thank you very much. I right. appreciate it. Have Thank, a good you. Thank you, guys. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Good morning. It's our map of Belize. And here also we have one of the most important fishing spots, Tornef Atoll Marine Reserve. Here's where your parents would go. Why do you think Turnip is important. For our dads to go and fish to bring them some types of fishes and money to our family. Yeah, correct. That's perfect. Turnip Atoll is the largest coral atoll in the Caribbean and it's located about 30 miles off the coast of Belize. It hosts a myriad of endemic species including fish, birds, and reptiles. It's just a very special place. Tarnef Atoll is one of the important fishing grounds for the fishing communities for many decades. It's part of their community culture. We sell conch to the international market. People love conch, people love lobster, people love fish. 
it's our livelihood. It's our bread and butter. It's what, what that makes us a living. The fishing industry provides 15 to 20,000 people with a direct source of income. When you look at a country with a very small population, that is huge. Well, over the last 30 years, there has been significant degradation of the marine ecosystem at the turn of Atoll. They're seeing that as the tourism grows, that there began to be some destruction of mangrove. You know, the fishing pressures became greater as more fishermen got licensed to fish. There are a lot of investors or developers who are going in, clearing the mangroves. There was really very little, if any, management out there. It was kind of a free-for-all. This all has a very negative impact on the environment. Because a lot of unlicensed fishermen, they will take anything out of the water. The conch population is gone. So we put pressure on us because suddenly depreciating or amount of stock that we'd have, right? There are some fishermen who are not considered. Leave it, let it grow, and let it multiply, you know? That's what the younger fishermen don't understand. They just want to come and take and take, and take, make the money now and forget about tomorrow. They are killing the, the industry. That industry, we cannot afford to let it fail. We declared the Turnip Atoll Marine Reserve in 2012 to help us now put in place focus management. Where several different interests put together their forces and we were able to create what is now TASA. TASA stands for Turnip Atoll Sustainability Association. And what we do here is try to sustain the marine life. We have a co-management agreement with the Fisheries Department and with the Government of Belize to manage the Turner Fatal Marine Reserve. Its primary focus is on good science-based management involving all the key stakeholders, particularly the fishing and the tourism community, preserving their way of life and educating. What we have done is divided the Turnip Atoll into different zones. Preservation zones and people aren't allowed to traverse or go into those zones. We have the conservation zones which protect special species. The general use zones where people fish under certain regulations. Then we have the special use zones which might protect a special species. So it's really about protecting a core portion of juvenile fish in order to provide area for those species to be able to spill over and replenish. Enforcement it is the only way that we can ensure that people comply with those rules and regulations. And so we have a team of nine officers, you know, at two conservation posts that basically go out every day and patrol the waters, check all the boats, whether they're fisheries boats, tourism boats, to ensure that they are in keeping with those. Yeah. That's our job, to enforce the law and make sure they don't take on the size or what is illegal. There have been at least three seizures recently of large quantities of conch that should never have been taken out of the sea. It is important to have people on the ground to enforce the requirements in terms of the fishing. We're not trying to stop fishing. We're just trying to manage it in a way that long term, it's, it's sustainable. Working with the fishermen is really important. Enforcement is not only catching them doing stuff, but it's that education and talking the back and forth and having them really and truly understand. What's this? What is the name of this? Turtle. That's uh, the green turtle. We do school visits trying to educate uh, the kids to learn why Turnef Atoll is important for their livelihoods. Turnef Atoll Marine Reserve. If there were no Turnef M, there will be no cones, no turtles, no fishes, no sharks. There will not be um, any money for the fishermen to have. That would be bad. And if there were no MC, there, there will not be any fish. It is very important to show our children of today to care and to protect. So 
as to have for future generations, as what TASA is doing. Very important to tell them that if we don't protect it now, there won't be anything left for them. This is a model that has worked in Belize and it has proven to be very efficient. The fish population is coming back, the corals are healthier. We've got sustainable development happening right next to that. And then we've got the fishing communities working hand in hand with the conservation and the tourism sector and have successful, thriving businesses. We now have fishers who are now saying, we want to depart from the extractive fishing practices that we want to now work with you to see how can we now look at other economic activities that complements what you're now doing in Turnif, like seaweed farming. Without the presence of the officers on the ground, people would just go back to doing what they used to do 30 years ago, you know, where they presume that there are no rules and regulation. The reality is that the government in Belize don't have the funds to support marine parks. It costs a lot of money to actually enforce it. TASA is able to bring a lot more resources to the table, to go out, to provide the type of management that's needed to do the research, to do the monitoring, and to do the education as well. In neighboring countries such as Guatemala and Honduras, we need to replicate this model for the benefit of all of us. I think it would be a great loss to humanity on a whole if we don't have a turn off anymore. So it, 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 it's very um, important, you know, it's very important. There's no place like Turnif.